Uh, my name is Casey Phillips. I'm the lead pharmacist with the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program here at the RQHR. And today we're going to be doing a presentation on uh, indications being included with antimicrobial orders. Uh, a couple of quick items to discuss before we get into the presentation, but uh, for those on remote sites, for telehealth, if you could mute your microphones unless you're asking questions, just to cut down background noise. And for people on Web WebEx, to make sure you hit star six to uh, mute your phones as well, to cut down background noise. And we do have a couple of attendance sheets. There should be one at the general as well. But if, if everyone can, uh, on the remote sites, if you can just email us who came to the uh, presentation today. Kelly, can I get you to just hand that out? Thanks so much. Um, and those attendance forms just really help us capture who's coming to these presentations and making sure we're, we're connecting with everyone we need to. And as well, at the very end, we've got paper copies of um, sort of a, uh, what do we call it? Evaluation. Evaluation form, that's the good word for it, yeah. And uh, we've also got one online, so there's different ways you guys can send an evaluation if you want to. How do I put it on? If you guys can make sure you fax it in or email it in, uh, however you can get it to us, uh, it helps us in our presentations. And once again, for the remote sites, if you can, uh, <laughs> for WebEx, if you can hit star six to cut down background noise, or if you're on telehealth, just mute your mic. So the title for today is Make Antimicrobials Great Again. We're going to be building a case for including the indication uh, for all antimicrobial orders when we are prescribing them. So a quick overview for today, we're going to just quickly look at why did this all start, where did this idea come from. Uh, secondly, building on the rationale for including an indication in all uh, antimicrobial orders. We also have some data collected from RPIW 92 and random audits that we can take a look at to continue to build our case, and finally look at what does this all mean as we put it all together. So why did this all start? It was uh, well over a year ago, there was a, a process called RPIW 92 that looked at uh, timely communication between the pharmacist and prescriber regarding antimicrobials to optimize patient outcomes. So sorry, it's so small on screen there, but this was a, a big process, the RPIW that looked at um, specifically on 6F, if we could utilize our pharmacy resources there and provide some education to patients, we would be able to improve our process of uh, improving antimicrobial ordering. And so what some of that included is that we would have a pharmacist on rounds uh, for daily rounds on 6F. Uh, they also developed some tools for just uh, uh, working through antimicrobial orders, including the MindMed mnemonic. And there was also a uh, work standard created, which was aiming to remind prescribers to include the indication for the antimicrobial on the actual physician order. So within the physician's order section, when you're writing an antimicrobial order, you have to include the indication. So, and as the RPIW went along, uh, it was evaluated as, as it rolled out. And uh, what they found here, it's, it's very difficult to see, but there was two metrics they were looking at. One was, were, were indications being included on those antimicrobial orders? And basically, it was is largely, uh, for well, for CTU patients, they found that physicians would include the orders uh, ranging from about 40 to 60 percent of the time, so it was, it was a, a little hit and miss. And sometimes they were doing better on the unit, sometimes they weren't doing as well. Um, some of the problems that they're running into is with the CTU, we've got a lot of newer physicians on there, whether they're a Jersey or they're a resident, and this was a new process for them adding this indication in. So they were really all over the place, and you had so many new learners coming in. Um, every few months, so it was a process that you had to continually try to upkeep in order to uh, maintain that metric. The second metric was, were pharmacists coming on rounds? And uh, good for the pharmacists in the crowd, we did really well on that. We we're pretty much always at 100%. So the um, 
antimicrobial stewardship program uh, came in during the RPIW process. Uh, so it was already a process that was in place. And uh, the, the people on 6F who were running it brought in the stewardship program to say, how can we improve our process? How can we get our numbers up so that we're capturing the indication more uh, efficiently? And also just needing some help with their, their metrics they are collecting and, and sort of the tool they're using to do their auditing process. So we came in. Uh, we used a program called REDCap. You can think of it, it's quite similar to SurveyMonkey. So for anyone who's got an online survey, it's basically a tool that guides you through an audit to look at charts and look at the patient to figure out, um, you know, were they, was an indication included with the order as well as capturing a number of different variables. And part of our process, or part of our difficulty, I should say, with the antimicrobial stewardship program is that when we started, we didn't really know how many antimicrobials we're using in the hospital or what we're using them for. So we started building uh, from our BDM data from Centricity. We started uh, building a lot of uh, data on um, what are we using for our different antimicrobials in different areas of the hospital. So for example, Tazobactam, we know we use a ton of it in the hospital. We can see which areas we're using it the most. Uh, we use a lot in ICU and ER. That's no surprise to anyone. But the difficult part is, okay, what does that mean now? We don't have any indications attached to this, so we can't really get too much into the appropriateness of those antimicrobials until we know what they're being used for. So this was the, uh, you know, going beyond just collecting data on what we're using. The next piece is, what are we using it for? And that's what brings us down to the indication piece again. So when we look at stewardship, this is a, a slide that's on pretty much every single presentation we do, and it goes back to the basics of what stewardship is. And the very first question we ask is, is an antibiotic necessary? So for me, this really goes into the indication. Is it indicated or not? And if it is indicated, what is the indication? So looking at that a little bit more closely, um, you know, we look at as pharmacists in the PC process, whenever we're looking at a drug therapy and trying to figure out if this is the best drug therapy for the patients, um, we'll look at, um, you know, a number of different variables, but the first thing is, is that drug indicated? And um, what, I, what I like about looking at indications for microbials is this really goes back to the, the source of the issue. Instead of dealing with issues down the line where we're getting into, okay, is that the right drug? Is it at the right dose, the right route? All that sort of stuff. That's a little bit downstream from where the problems start, right? So very simply, we want to go right to the start where there are being wheels being ordered. Let's in include the indication right there. Uh, and start solving some problems up front instead of fixing them down the line. So again, with the indication is, if we ask ourselves the, the question, is an antibiotic necessary? If it's no, treatment's not indicated, so in which case we should stop or not start an antimicrobial. Or yes, if there is an indication, now we can know, okay, let's choose the right drug, dose, duration, and route for that indication. So a little bit more about the rationale for, for why we should do this. If we look at, um, you know, the IDSA, uh, SHEA guidelines on uh, how to set up an antimicrobial stewardship program, two of the big core strategies they look at are uh, performing prospective audit with intervention and feedback and formulary restriction. In both those cases, if we're trying to assess this as clinicians in the hospital, we need to know the indication before we can make any sort of judgment on that. We also have, uh, like the CDC with their Get Smart program, um, they advocate for, for the use of policies that really improve antimicrobial prescribing. But uh, again, with them, they, they kind of get down to making sure information and, and there's adequate documentation on the indication for that antimicrobial, as well as developing tools such as the one that you know, I have a little little highlight on it here, but somewhat very similar to that red cap program, 
we developed to make sure that we're capturing indication when we're auditing our antimicrobial orders. And again, this is from the CDC, but these programs help clinicians improve the quality of patient care and improve patient safety through increased infection cure rates. And, you know, really it all comes down again to, um, you know, a big piece of the puzzle is including that indication. So, you know, going beyond seeing what we'll see in guidelines and uh, different groups saying this is something you should do. Uh, one thing that I really like to think about um, is just how does this help you in your day? What does it actually mean for you? Because there's so many uh, add-ons we do and when, when change comes along in the hospital, um, it's, it's difficult. And I always like to bring in the qu question, you know, well, what is this doing for me? You know, going beyond, I think we can all agree that these are great patient-first initiatives. It's for patient safety. It's going to improve their care. But what does it mean for us, and how does it make our job better? And I think there's a good case for, for a number of these factors. So we have a number of pharmacists in the audience and at our other sites. And, and one thing that I think this really does for us is when we get orders and we need to assess it for appropriateness, this really streamlines our assessment. So it allows us, you know, we have a clear indication up front and then we can figure out from there, from the indication, which drug should we, would be better or does that drug fit? Is it the right dose for that indication? Is it the right route and the right duration? So for example, if we think of a drug like ceftriaxone, we use a lot of it in the hospital again too. But we, you know, as a pharmacist, a lot of the time it's just getting that order for ceftriaxone, one gram Q24. Well, it looks appropriately it looks appropriate, but I have no idea what the indication is. So a lot of the time, we'll just put those through, and yeah, I hope it's for the correct indication. But with ceftriaxone, if we're going for meningitis, it would the correct dose would be 2 grams Q12, right? So it really changes our whole approach to that patient. So knowing the indication up front completely changes, uh, you know, our, our um, determining what the best course of action is. Does that make sense? I think it does. Um, another thing for us is, you know, we, also, we, we have these antimicrobial policies in place which largely try to restrict certain antimicrobials that we want to reserve uh, for specific indications and specific patients. But when we're trying to make that assessment, often remotely from our, a satellite uh, location or from the basement of the hospital, it's really difficult to do that when we don't know the indication. So it, it creates a lot more work trying to either track down the prescriber or a nurse or somebody who knows the indication in order to uh, validate that order and either send it or not send it, right? And one more thing is it really improves our ability for appropriate me appropriateness metrics. So again, when we go back to we know what we're using in the hospital, but not why. If we're collecting more of that data on the why, we can start pairing which antimicrobials we're using for which indications and which areas, and just gives us so much more information to play with. As a nurse, and this is what I've been talking to uh, with different nurses on the ward, what I like is just that, again, that clear documentation of the indication. And, you know, I, I see some of their frustrations when they have a patient who's come in from the ICU or come up from the ER. The patient's on antibiotics, but there's nothing really documented or a clear indication why. So you're the nurse now taking over the care of this patient and having to manage them. And you don't really know why they're on antibiotics. That's something that's quite frustrating. Um, I think it also helps with that communication piece with the physicians. So when the nurse is phoning that physician in the evening when they're on call to say, can we extend their, you know, their tasis in order is running out. Can we extend it? You know, I think it's got to be a little bit difficult for the, the, for, for, for the physician to say, well, okay, uh, why are they on it? If the nurse doesn't know, you know, it's a big gap in care. And then I think with a lot of those patients, a lot of the time what will happen is it's just, yeah, extend it, and I'll reassess it later, but it, it doesn't really get the reassessment that it needs. And I think if we do have the indication there, 
it just helps that process so much more to know, okay, therapy should be done, we should change, we should continue, or can we change to something else? Um, another thing, again, for nurses, when you are getting that patient from another area or somebody started on anti an antimicrobial, I think you need to know what the indication is so you're able to better manage that patient and know which monitoring parameters you're going to look at for that patient. So if you know they're started on that tazosin, but now it's for uh, hospital-acquired pneumonia, you're going to know perhaps which, which parameters you're going to look for more in that patient if they're improving or getting worse. And I, again, I think it just uh, adds value for nurses in knowing the indication that it, it, it sort of creates a, a better opportunity uh, for nurses to be able to address those questions with a physician to uh, question, you know, is this the right drug? Is it the right dose? Can we step them down to PO? Uh, you know, I noticed this patient's been on antibiotics for two weeks. Is this a point we can stop? That sort of thing. So it just gives the, the nurse that much more information uh, to be able to do their job more appropriately. And lastly, as a physician, um, again, you get the clear documentation of the, the indication. If you're a physician who's coming in as a consult or you're the attending, you're going to spend less time mining through the chart looking for, okay, why did somebody else start my patient on an antimicrobial? Uh, unless it's written clearly somewhere, you know, your patient's going to be on this antibiotic and you don't even know why. So to cut down on that frustration, I think it'll help physicians as well. I think it also will re result in less callbacks from, from pharmacy or from nursing to say, you know, why is this patient on the antibiotic? What do we, you know, what should we look for with monitoring? Just cutting down phone calls, again, making their day more efficient. Um, and again, for them, it, you know, gives them the opportunity to address those appropriateness questions such as duration and IV to PO step down. Um, on the flip side, how does this make our workday more difficult? I don't think there's a whole lot of negatives to this, to be honest. Um, I think this is a really good uh, intervention we can have, but I think some of the points that will come up is, as a pharmacist, I just want to make it very clear, there's not going to be, with us wanting to move towards this intervention, uh, we're not asking anyone to change their current process, okay? We're going to continue... Um, current processes and uh, one thing that may occur down the line or what we would need to talk about pharmacy is um, initially when this came out pharmacists were including the indication in the SIG field when we were putting through orders and that's now stopped. We're not restarting that or changing any kind of process but I think that could be something that's helpful but it's going to take some conversations with the pharmacy department just to make sure is this the best way we can do it and the best way we can capture the data we need to. Um, as a nurse, you know, I, I think some of their reservations with looking at this would be, this is another add-on for nursing. The physicians aren't going to do a good job with it, and then I'm going to be stuck harassing them. I see a bunch of nurses in here smiling, going, yep, that's going <laughs> to, you know. And, but what, what we have uh, specifically discussed with this, though, too, is really the onus has to be on the physician to do their job up front and make sure that indication is there so that everyone else can do their job. So it's, I don't want this to be an add-on for nursing, but I just want it, you know, if anything, it just gives you a lot more tools in the toolkit to be able to do your job better. And lastly, as a physician, um, you know, in the words of Terry Ross, who we just talked to yesterday, it's a new process and change is hard. You know, it's gonna, gonna be a difficult long time to, to make this into a new process that people can stick with. Um, I think a lot of physicians will also be like, well, it, it takes too much time for me to add in the indication, right? And I don't really believe this at all. To really write for pneumonia, if it saves you, you know, uh, three minutes later that day getting a phone call and five minutes <laughs> the next day getting another phone call or you know, the 10 minutes you're gonna to take to dig through the chart to figure out why your patient is on something. I think to just that little, you could even write PNA for pneumonia. I don't know, that's gonna take, what, half a second? Like really, it's not gonna to be too time consuming. Uh, but I, I can see one of the barriers that may come up is, is there medical legal implications to this if they're writing that diagnosis or indication with the antibiotic? 
Uh, and this is something we'll have to discuss with our physician groups, but uh, it's kind of one of those things that I think often comes up with, with uh, physician groups when we're looking at change, so it could be an issue as well. So next thing, um, we're going to just uh, quickly go through some of the data from RPIW 92 and our random audits. So on the right, you can see here some of the information we are collecting with these data tools. So it gets into basic uh, demographic information, uh, you know, where the patient is, what their unit is. Uh, and for antimicrobials, it'll capture which specific drug dose route, interval duration, uh, specific prescribers. So now we can you know, attach those different orders to the different prescribers. Uh, was the indication written with the order, yes or no? And if it wasn't, you know, is the indication documented somewhere in the chart? We hope it is, or is it not documented at all? And also the indication description, so looking at our common indications or others as well. Uh, just as a quick note, RPIW 92, this is again the uh, intervention that was done on 6F and specifically looking at CTU patients. When we did some work, um, when we, we went in to give that auditing tool to uh, the folks on 6F, one thing we did is we said, well, you don't really have any kind of comparative group, so how about we start collecting data on our 6F patients and we'll separate them into CTU, where we're really trying to get the prescribers to include the indication versus our non-CTU patients, which is just our normal process. And over time, this is from the last few months of uh, doing audits, we're founding that in CTU patients, roughly 61% of the time, they were documenting the indication with the order, so doing pretty good, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. Uh, versus our non-CTU patients we're sitting around 13%. So we can see it's, it's quite, a, quite a difference when we are trying to make that intervention and make it stick. Uh, something else that we are collecting is the percent of indications recorded by prescriber status. So looking at, you know, is, is there a difference between our groups like an attending versus a uh, physician who comes in as on, on a consult versus our jerseys and residents. And what we could really see in the purple and blue here, sorry, it's, it's uh, difficult to see, but the purple and, and the lighter blue, those are our, our uh, or sorry, purple is pharmacy. We got 100% for documenting. There was only one, but in other charts I saw, <laughs> but that's good. We got to celebrate our successes, right? But I, you know, it does bring me back to, what I did notice when I was doing the audit, uh, the audits, is that pharmacists did a great job of when they saw somebody was on antimicrobial therapy and we were writing a note. We made it really clear, you know, this is what they're currently on. This indication, and pharmacists do a good job with documentation. Uh, residents in Jersey's are also doing really well with including the indication when they're writing writing the order. Uh, but we have some work to do with our attendings. They're the worst at it, to be honest. So <laughs> I don't know if that's just uh, teaching an old dog new tricks um, or, or what the process will take to get them more involved in this, uh, but the jerseys and residents definitely had good uptake with this. Um, next, we're just going to look at where is the indication noted. And what I found here is that the indication could be noted in a number of different areas. So we were hoping to see it with the original order. If it wasn't there, we wanted to know, okay, do we look in the progress notes for it? Do we look in the consult notes, nursing notes? And we were finding there was an indication a lot of the time somewhere in the chart, but you really had to dig around to figure out why they were on this antibiotic. And in many cases, kind of making a bit of a judgment. Yeah, it started around the same time they're talking about some shortness of breath, they did a chest x-ray. So I'm thinking pneumonia, but nobody has said anything really. So it, it makes you jump to a lot of conclusions about you know, why this, this patient is actually on that therapy. Um, one thing that I also found really frustrating is uh, going through different areas of the chart and sometimes seeing different indications written in different areas. So you're, you're left wondering, okay, well, what are we treating? Is it ammonia or urosepsis? 
or an osteomyelitis. I have all three of these in different areas of the chart, right? Um, but I think the most alarming piece for us is that when we look at, okay, our CTU patients, 22% uh, of the time, there was no documentation anywhere that we could find to say why they're on that antimicrobial. So we have patients who are on antimicrobials with no idea why. Uh, much worse, when we look at our non-CTU patients, they're sitting at about 61%. So, you know, two-thirds of our, our people are on antimicrobials and we don't know why. So it's not a great statistic. Um, and just lastly, kind of looking at how we're trending, you know, over time the last few months, we did really well initially getting our numbers up, but we're starting to slide a bit. And I think this speaks to having that, uh, you know, continual upkeep with the folks on 6F to make sure that we're, we're doing a better job of educating and re-educating and giving them their results back so they can see how they're doing to continually improve. Um, this now looks at the random audit data. So while this process was going on on 6F, we also started uh, collecting this information all around the hospital at both the general and the PASQA and uh, collecting very similar information. And so this is uh, looking at that first question again, was the indication written with the antimicrobial order? And at the general, we're sitting at about 18% uh, for yes, we include an indication at the PASQA, we're sitting at about 7%, so definitely uh, there's only room for improvement there if we, if we start this intervention. And remember, when we're trying to do that in, intervention with the folks on CTU, we're sitting around 61%, so much better. Second question is percentage of indications recorded by prescriber status. So. Um, there's nothing that really jumps out here, but the point I wanted to make with looking at this slide is that it was interesting to note when we were at different areas throughout the general hospital, we could see those same residents that had been trained on CTU, they were taking that same practice to other areas of the hospital and utilizing it there, finding that it was a beneficial practice for them and their colleagues. And that process stuck with them. So that was, that was nice to see that the intervention is reproducible in other areas besides CTU patients. And lastly, where is the indication documented or noted? Um, and again, we have some fairly high numbers here, not as bad as our non-CTU patients, but uh, at the RGH, 22% of patients where we have no indication noted or documented in the charts. And at the PASCO, is a little higher at 26%. So bringing it all together, and what does this all mean? We can see that RPI W92 set the foundation for having an indication included with our antimicrobial orders. And if we include the indication, I think it has several benefits for us. It's, the biggest thing is providing that clear communication and documentation for the entire care team. Everyone's on the same page. We all know what's going on. Um, you know, and I, I think this is the biggest piece for pharmacists. It really streamlines that process where we assess for appropriateness. We need the indication to be able to appropriately do that. From our RPIW and random audit uh, data, we can see that orders with indication, it can actually be operationalized. This is something we can do, and it can be reproduced on other areas, as, as we've seen Jersey's doing it around the hospital. Um, but one really important piece here is what we don't know yet. Um, we're still very early in this process, how this would all be operationalized and, um, you know, put out for everyone to use as there's a, a new standard process. It would take a lot of time. And as I said, change is hard. You know, it, it, it can be done, but it would be a long process. It would be <laughs> not without its difficulties. And an important point, point for me, though, too, is I believe that if you need to write that indication with the antimicrobial, what's been found in the literature is that if you do have to write an indication, it actually decreases the number of antimicrobial orders you do get. Because I think very often we're throwing on antibiotics, we'll put it on as a just-in-case. You know, well, it looks like heart failure. Actually, I'm pretty sure it's heart failure. 
but I'll start the tasis in just in case it's an pneumonia, maybe, you know, and even as we figure out definitively, yes, this is a heart failure patient, we're treating them for heart failure, well, we'll let the antibiotics go about seven days, maybe 10, just, just in case again, right? So we will actually cut down our number of antimicrobials we order up front, but what that translates into for clinical outcomes, which are more important, is, you know, are we gonna impact length of stay at all? Are we gonna impact our duration of therapy? I hope so, but we don't know that. And also, in the grand scheme of things, as an antimicrobial stewardship program, will that decrease in usage translate into a decrease in antimicrobial resistance? Kind of tough sell, maybe, hopefully, but we won't really know until we get there. So lastly, let's make antimicrobials great again. This was going to be the original poster, and then Jesse Minion kind of stepped on my dreams. I said, no. <laughs> You're unprofessional, Casey, what's wrong with that? But, um, you know, I'll start off by opening up questions for the remote sites, if... Sorry, Bob. Uh, I just wanted to add, like, on your last slide, you talked about care team. I think there's another slide about the, sort of the expectations of physicians, pharmacists, nursing. The other piece to that, too, that we do is the, the patient population with, with the antimicrobial program. We're really engaging with the patients to be their own advocates, but as well as nursing or physicians. We should expect those questions and encourage those questions for patients. Um, you know, what questions you have. And, you know, it's always kind of moving around looking for the question that they might be asking to encourage that knowledge base about the importance of, of this work and that there, there's responsibility on the patient as well. You right. might want to repeat to this sure. or summarize. Yeah, so just uh, just as a summary for the remote sites, uh, so our, our program director, Bob Parker, had a, I don't know if it was a question, it was, he said something really nice, but it was uh, basically, you know, going beyond, um, you know, what this is doing to help pharmacists, physicians. We have to really look at how this helps patients, and, uh, you know, we have a couple of our patient advocates here in the room. I think it is an important point that this is a patient first uh, initiative um, and, and really empowering patients, uh, giving them uh, the knowledge, you know, the knowledge and the ability should, to. As, as the care providers, we should have that expectation that they're yeah. going to ask us. They're going to ask us, is it the right drug? Yeah, so to reiterate, you know, as, as the clinician, we should be able to expect that uh, patients will ask these questions when they're really looking out for their own care. Is this the right antimicrobial for me? Is this the right duration? that sort of thing. So expect those questions as you move along. So any questions from the remote sites? Okay, I'll turn it. Um, any questions here? Oh, we do have a question. All right. How do you plan on implementing this with the physicians then? So the question is, how do we plan on implementing that with the physicians? I don't know yet, to be honest. You know, it's, um, I could look at how was it implemented on 6F and the CTU. Basically, it was meeting with those prescribers uh, and just giving a very brief overview of this is the process we're, we're taking and this is how we're gonna do it and we're gonna measure it. Um, but we, there was a lot of support that was put in place on 6F with nurses like Sherry Kraft who went around hounding the physicians, hounding the residents in Jersey to make sure that it was actually done. So I think this is one of those things that if we were to put it in place, it would take a lot of support uh, to get it up and running because it is a new process for everyone. But I, I think one, um, I'm gonna shift gears here a little bit, but one important point that goes into this is, is there's also the question of uh, computerized physician order entry and, and more computerized charting. Um, I think this lends into that as well because I, I believe eventually when we have more of those tools, this will be something that's expected when we get to that point. Um, so I think it'd be great to <clears throat> have these processes already in place and have prescribers already thinking up front of including the indication 
before we have something like CPOE where they would be, you know, it would be a, 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 a field that they would have to populate in order to get that drug. But we're, we're very early in the process as far as how do we actually implement this and, and how do we reach out to all those physicians. On that, some of the things that we're involved in is like our G12. Do you want to come up and... So I'm just going to get Bob Parker to come up to the front. He just has a, a statement about the question. So, excellent question. Um, so some of the things the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program is involved with right now, um, we have what we're calling our G12, which is our group of 12 community clinics. So this is also a community intervention. We've got four clinics in Regina as well as eight clinics throughout rural where we're looking and we're showing them the data around the intervention. So uh, this is your order, this is how much you prescribe, but again, we can't tell you why you're prescribing it. So did you know there's a spot that you could enter in the indication or did you even know that it's sort of a requirement or an expectation that the indication is, is documented? Um, within the hospital, uh, we are working with the emergency department around um, you know their orders that are going out and around the the indication topic, uh, as well as pediatrics. So the reason we do these sort of smaller interventions is that we, we really put the onus back on the physician or that group because we hear comments like, oh, well, pharmacy will catch it, or oh, well, nursing will catch it. And it's like, well, you know what? Yes, they will, but at the same time, you know, everybody in stewardship around antimicrobials has to know their part, has to have the understanding. And really, the first step is the physician writing the order with the indication. So we turn to the physicians that we're working with in these groups and we say, so what do you think is gonna solve this problem and how will we spread this out throughout the organization? Um, not only within the RQ, but you know, how far can we reach with this message? So you know, putting information into the physicians' newsletters that go out, we've got our five minute updates that go out, um, there's different communications and then presentations like this as well. Um, we'll go to the physician groups and then you know, that'll just sort of raise that that flag and get the conversation going, really. And then as we approach things like the CPOE, where it becomes like a mandatory field, it's not just sort of this new thing that's just happened. It's it's something that we've been talking about for quite some time. Excellent question. Sorry to... Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that <clears throat> that sounds perfect. Any other questions? Yes. Another question for you. In terms of like measuring like outcome effectiveness, like do you have any data in regards to... Um, like of those where an indication was provided where you had to make recommendations, do you have outcome measures like that where it showed where a pharmacist intervened and provided recommendations that have, do you have any data in respect to that? So specific uh, data or metrics on if the indication was was there and pharmacy... Like had to, had to provide some level of intervention where they provided a recommendation and change in like medication or dosing and stuff like that. You know, I don't have any any specific information on on those. Um, I think those would be great metrics to collect, and something we would have to, if we collect those with our audit tool, we'd have to add some extra fields. Uh, I don't know if Kelly could speak to this as far as if those are captured at all in Aim High or. No, we we actually capture interventions numbers, but not outcomes. Uh, we typically expect that our interventions, though, are producing good outcomes. So it's very rare, I'd say, that we actually make an intervention that turns out bad. But it could. But we don't actually have that outcome data. It would be nice to have. I think, I think that's so hard to do without that automatic chart field entry to allow you to do that while you're doing your work it would be so much easier. Not that dissimilar from mandatory reporting fields. Like if they had to put indication in, they would. Otherwise, they don't get any drug. It's funny how we let it go, though. That's the part that got me insane, most everybody else insane. And we typically try 500 other workarounds when reality is the physician has to write the damn thing on the order. It's not that hard. And I think the medical legal issue is not really an issue because it will become mandatory. So. If yeah. If they think it's an issue now, they better get working on it because they will have to do it. There's going to be no ifs, ands, or buts. That would be a field you can't get through. I don't think it is a medical legal no, issue. Really. Like when I did my like training, like you're the UFM, I'm a nurse practitioner, but um, we were trained to put the diagnosis on the prescription. 
and I mean for that reason, in case of, you know you prescribed the wrong dose, or else well, also for right. exceptional drug status, the pharmacists are really appreciative of it when you have that indication written on there, and then yeah, it's a valuable tool, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So I hope everyone in our remote sites could hear our conversation. Um, thank you once again, everyone, for coming out today or tuning in. Uh, this is my first WebEx uh, sort of presentation, which is exciting to, to know I'm in the internet somehow. I don't know how computers work, so. It's, uh, but I know I'm in the internet, I think. I think that's how it works. And so I'll leave it at that. Once again, if you guys can fill out your evaluation, um, or your evaluation forms and either fax them in, give them to us, or we'll collect them at our different sites. Uh, thanks so much, and we hope to see you all next month for our next rounds. <clears throat> Thank you.